This summer, we have been learning about God's wisdom for, for living through the book of Proverbs. Wisdom is, um, is competence with regard to the complex realities of life. And, and being wise isn't less than being moral and good. It's actually more. It's knowing and choosing the right thing at the right time. Now, Americans, we Americans can get very frustrated uh, reading the book of Proverbs because we're very technique-oriented. And so we want to follow the techniques. And it's interesting, you, there's plenty of technique. There's lots of adages. As if you do this, then these are the results. And that's, that's a lot of the first half of the book of Proverbs. And then the second half starts dealing with all of the exceptions to the rules. And so it can get frustrated because it's not so predictable. It doesn't always give us methods by which we can make wise decisions. But more so, as I've been reading through the book of Proverbs, it's saying this, here's the kind of person you need to become so that you make wise decisions. That a lot of that wisdom starts here with your character, not just techniques and adages and nice little sayings that fit on your wall with a beautiful picture of a seagull over an ocean. It's character. It's reflecting the heart of God and the wisdom and the fear of the Lord that will lead to wise decisions. It's interesting that even over and over again in the Bible, especially the Proverbs, it says, if you think you're wise and, you're a wi and you've arrived, then you're a fool. But if you're painfully aware of your foolishness, of your mistakes, of, of your less than, then you're on your way to becoming wise. It's a, about a good dose of humility, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at a character quality that might be the most crucial in becoming a wise person, and that is humility. But to get to humility... We have to understand its counterpart, and that is pride. Listen in to various scriptures from the Proverbs. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. A man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his tongue. Where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. The Lord tears down the proud man's house, but he keeps the widow's boundaries intact. The fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, are sin. This is God's word. My first big ministry job was at Covenant Presbyterian Church in West Lafayette, Indiana. I had grown up in that church all through high school. I left and went away to Taylor University. And then they, upon my graduation, they called me and said, would you please come back to your home church and would you lead our collegiate ministry to Purdue students? I was extremely excited to do that. I wasn't ready to go to seminary yet, although I was called by God in that church in ninth grade to be a pastor. I was utterly convinced of that. Um, so I was glad to go do some ministry rather than go hit more books. I wasn't always the best of students. But one Sunday, I remember uh, running around. We had a couple of services. Lots of uh, Purdue students would come to these services. It was a large church, a couple thousand members, 10 staff, uh, staff members, a lot going on. And uh, one Sunday, I'm just running around doing my thing, and a deacon Jim was his name, I can't remember his last name, but he grabbed my arm and said, Steve, we need help with the offering. And I looked at him and I said, but I'm a staff member, and I ran off. I turned quickly and I, and I, I moved to the more noble thing. I sat with all of the Purdue students 
uh, who are in my ministry. I'm still a bit embarrassed to tell you this story because it exposed my pride. What a haughty thing to think and say that I was above serving the congregation and I simply couldn't pass an offering plate. Bad move, Steve. We're going to do three things. We're going to talk about what, what pride is. Let's diagnose pride. Let's look at pride's force, and then we'll look at pride's antidote humility. First of all, pride diagnosed. What is pride? I've got a few definitions here. Follow along. One, there's elements to pride. There's layers to pride. It's not just one thing. Boy, it, we can come at it at all sorts of different angles and facets. So, one, pride is needing to feel better than other people in some way. Proverbs eleven twelve says this, a man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor. Derides people means puts them down, talks smack. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said this, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they're not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above all the rest. Why do we join certain clubs and organizations and fraternal orders and sports clubs and professional organizations? Usually, deep down, the main motivation is this. It will look good on my resume. I will feel and look accomplished, important. And what is a resume? It's the evidence for your case that you're a somebody. That you're a person of significance or importance. A person of consequence. And do you realize that in one way or another, we're all trying to make our case with other people? In Arthur Miller's play, After the Fall, the main character, Quentin, muses, and he's thinking out loud to himself, and he says this, for years I looked at life like a case of law. A series of arguments. When you're young, you prove how brave you are or how smart or what a good lover you are. Later, what a good husband or father you are. And finally, how wise and powerful or whatever. But underlying it all, I now see there was an assumption that a person moves on a path toward, I don't know, toward being justified or condemned. A verdict. Anyway, my disaster happened one day when I looked up and I realized that the bench was empty. No God, no judge in sight, and all that remained was the endless argument with myself. The litigation of existence before an empty bench, which is another way of saying, of course, despair. Each one of us, every human being, inexorably, unavoidably, is earning his or her salvation. We're all unsatisfied enough, incomplete enough in some way. We're all trying out there, uh, trying to amass and compose a carefully crafted resume. We're in a courtroom constantly arguing, endless litigation. Whether you believe in God or not, we're all out there trying to earn our salvation, our validation, our importance. And there's an endless accumulation of evidence. There's mountains of affidavits, constant trials, arguments, rebuttals, endless spinning for and against a verdict. And what's that verdict? We want to say, I'm a person who counts. I'm a person of worth. I'm okay. I'm not okay, but that's okay, but I'm okay. However you want to spin it. 
Every person needs to prove this to themselves and other people. And therefore, we are always and constantly in a court. We're all arguing. If you're a religious person, you're arguing against God. If you're not a religious person, you're arguing against and with other people. You just have to do it. We're all doing it. And even if you're not doing well, we do it individually, but then we, we, we get others with us, right? And one group looks at another and says, oh, we're cooler and more sophisticated. We're smarter. And the other group says, I hate cooler, pretentious people. We're down to earth. We're hardworking people. You see, pride is needing to feel better than other people in some way. That's one aspect of pride. Let me share with you another one. Pride needs to take God's place in your life. There are several Hebrew words for pride, and a couple of them that we, uh, I had read, the, the Hebrew word geon means supreme majesty, and that's almost always applied uh, to God himself. But the Bible says that every single heart wants to be its own supreme being. We all want to call our own shots. We all want to say what's right and what's wrong we all deep down want to set up our own private autonomous zones. Because autonomy literally means self-law, self-governance. And that's what's causing the endless litigation and the need for a claim. We want to be on the throne of our life. Pride says, I will be somebody I don't need God to be the somebody in my life. A Christian um, author and uh, psychologist, Lewis Smeads, he said this, Pride in the spiritual sense is a refusal to allow God to be God. It's to grab God's status for your own life. It's turning down God's invitation to join the dance of life as a creature in his garden and wishing instead to be the creator, independent, reliant on your own resources. And that is the great delusion, the delusional fantasy of all fantasies, the cosmic put on, the fantasy that we can make it on our, we can make it as our own God leaves us empty at the center. We're therefore attacked by demons of fear and anxiety all the time. So we learn to swagger. We learn to bluff. And deep down inside, we're afraid we can't make it on our own. And therefore, we look around for people to use as buttresses for the shaky ego our pride has created. We look for those people. Now, every situation calls forth this question. What can I get out of this situation to support the need of my ego for power and applause? And every new person we meet elicits this question. How could this person, I'm pointing at you, but I don't mean you, Betsy, because you're sweet, but you're here and in my line of sight. How can this person contribute to my need to prove that I'm better than other people? And so life becomes a constant battle to use people to bolster your own self to avoid letting others use you in the same way that you're using them. Why? Because deep down we're empty in the center. Pride is needing to feel better than other people in some way. Pride needs to take the place of God in your life. And thirdly, pride is constantly aware of self. That's the nature of pride, always thinking about ourselves, how I'm looking, how I'm performing, how I'm treating others, how people are treating me. Proverbs 13.10 says this, pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Don't tell me how to do it. Don't tell me how to live life. Don't tell me how I should view my politics. I'll figure out. I can do it myself. The proud person is always about him or her. And that self is always calling attention to itself. And that's just not confident people with a higher self-esteem. Those with low self-esteem have massive pride issues. Why? 
because they're always thinking about themselves. You see, a person of low self-esteem is just as proud with someone with a superiority complex because the person of low self-esteem are morbidly self-conscious. It reminds me of the, of the middle schooler. What's the middle schooler's unsaid credo? Don't do anything to embarrass yourself or draw undue attention to me. Right? That's why in middle school, kids learn sarcasm. It's a low form of humor that just puts other people down. Because they're so insecure themselves. What's the worst thing that could happen when I was walking through the halls of Tecumseh Junior High School and that somebody could flip your books? Do you remember that? That was back before the days when everybody carried a backpack, but you might have a stack of books under your arm. And if you walked up behind somebody and you gave it a shove forward or you ripped them back, and next thing it, your, 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 your peachy folder with all your papers is all over the hallway, your books are scattered. And of course, being in middle school, there's nobody's going to stop and help you. What do they do? Oh no, they start kicking everything down the hall. That's why in middle school, your, your kids start saying, uh, would you drop me off a block from here? Don't do anything to embarrass yourself. Don't do anything to draw undue attention to you. You see, we're all, but we're all that way. It's not just middle schoolers. Many of us continue to live life that way. Always on trial. Always worried about the verdict. Not just the verdict that others may put on me, but the verdict I render upon myself. Well, that's pride. What about pride's force? The Bible, well, let me, let me hit Augustine first. He's one of my favorites, St. Augustine. He talks about pride's force when he says this, it was pride that changed angels into demons. Hmm. You see, we don't, we share the same issue that, that angels had, wanting to be God. And that drove them into demons, some of them. The Bible puts it this way, pride goes before destruction. It doesn't say pride might happen before destruction. It says you might get lucky and be proud, but then you might not get destroyed. No, it says that pride absolutely goes before destruction. It's a necessary uh, consequence. First pride, then fall. And there's a practical reason for this. A proud person doesn't learn very well from their mistakes. Because pride distorts and, and, and discolors everything they see pride distorts your view of reality and your view of yourself. One of my favorite sayings from one of my mentors, Jack Miller, is this, pride by its very nature is self-deceptive. I mean, come on, ask an opinionated person, how opinionated do you think you are? And what are they going to say? Who, me? I don't think I'm very opinionated, right? They just don't see it. Ask a really smug and haughty and, and proud person, uh, how proud do you think you are? Oh, I'm not proud. I'm just, I'm just more confident than you. They don't get it. So there's a practical reason for that. There's also a cosmic reason, a spiritual reason. Proverbs 16, verses uh, 18 and 19 say, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share the plunder with the proud. My friends, in the Bible, God loves and is drawn to the weak, the poor, the marginalized, the minority, the handicapped, the ashamed all those who've lost power and position in this world, those who've lost their pride. Isaiah 66, 12 says this, this is the one whom I esteem. This is God speaking. This is the person in whom I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in heart and trembles at my word. My friends, God will lift up the humble but he puts down the proud. Why? 
I think it's because God dwells in community. He's a trinity. Each person selflessly loving the other, each giving the other two more glory than they want for themselves, never taking glory for themselves. What, no one in the Trinity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is puffed up or thinks their role or identity is greater than the others. And that's how God operates. But fallen man has marred the image of God. And we've all gone self-seeking after our own glory. And so the proud person is on a collision course with the very nature of the Godhead and with God's plan. So if we're all infected with pride, what's the antidote? We're all hoping that an antidote to coronavirus will come soon so that there can be college football and that so our teachers can be safe in their classroom and teach their kids and that we could all get out of our quarantine. We still need a pride antidote more than we need. We still need an antidote to pride more than we need an antidote for coronavirus because pride is always fatal. Pride's antidote is humility. Proverbs 15, the fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom and humility comes before honor. It's akin to what Jesus was saying, right? The first will be last and the last will be first. My favorite definition of humility comes from C.S. Lewis. You might have heard it from Tim Keller. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. If you didn't catch that, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And we see this in the life of Jesus. Paul puts it and expresses it beautifully in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of us not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then he goes on, just like Jesus did when he left his father's palace in heaven and came down to this earth to rescue a sin-smeared terminal wretches. He didn't have to leave his position up there. He didn't descend, Jesus did not descend into the depths of humanity to come slumming among mortals to give his self-esteem a booster shot. He was not here on a temporary or short-term mission trip just so he could go back to heaven and feel appreciative of what God has done for him and how much he had there. He didn't come here to give his pride a fix. No, he willingly came fully adorned in compassion and humility. He came not for himself. He didn't come to boost his resume. In came, instead, he came because he observed and knew that humanity was harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, makes this observation. He says, in the four gospel accounts given to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 89 chapters of biblical text, there's only one place where Jesus himself tells us about his heart. We learn much in the four gospels about Christ's teaching. We read of his birth, his ministry, his disciples. We're told of his travels and prayer habits. We find lengthy speeches and repeated objections by his hearers, prompting further teaching. We learn of the way he understood himself to fulfill the whole Old Testament. 
And we learn in all four accounts of his unjust arrest and shameful death and astonishing resurrection. Consider the thousands of pages that have been written by theologians during the past 2,000 years of all these, thi all these things. But in only one place, perhaps the most wonderful words ever uttered by human lips, do we hear Jesus himself open up to us his very heart in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the in the one place in the Bible where the Son of God pulls back the veil and lets us peer into the very core of who he is, we're not told that he is austere and demanding in heart. We're not told that he's exalted and dignified in heart. We're not even told that he is joyful and generous in heart. Letting Jesus set the terms, his surprising claim is that he is gentle and lowly in heart. And when Jesus tells us what animates him most deeply, what is most true of him, then he exposes the innermost resources of his being. And what we find there is gentle and lowly. He is humble and meek. This is who he is. Tender, open, welcoming, accommodating, understanding, willing. And if we were asked to say only one thing about who Jesus is, we would be honoring his own teaching and self-revelation if our answer is gentle and lowly. My friends, this this high and holy Christ does not cringe at reaching out and touching dirty sinners and numbed sufferers. Such an embrace is precisely what he loves to do. He cannot bear to hold back. Who could have ever thought of such a Savior? So friends, if you're willing to get off your own high horse... If you're willing to admit that your pride has been the number one cause of the problems and the conflicts in your life, if you're willing to repent of your desire to always be right, always be first, always be superior, always win the argument, then Jesus, gentle and lowly Jesus, is ready to receive you with all humility and gentleness. I assure you, he will not have one shred of condesc condensation, excuse me, condescension. He's not going to spit on you either. He's not going to look at you and say, well, it's about time. He's not going to do that. He's not going to look down at his nose at you and poke you in the chest and say, finally, you should have known better and come to me sooner. He's not going to do that. That's not gentle and lowly. He's not going to turn away in disgust, saying, sorry, you've done too much and you've gone too far for me to help you now. No, 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 no. He's never going to do or say that. Why? Because he is gentle and lowly of heart. He is humble. And he loves to associate with lowly people. What did Garth Brooks sing? I've got friends in lowly places. You know how Jesus' song goes? All my friends come from lowly places and only lowly places. My friends, the verdict is in. Even though you are more proud and flawed than you ever dared admit, through Jesus, who is gentle 
and lonely, you are more loved and accepted and cherished than you ever dared dream because Christ emptied himself. He humbled himself so that you could be a somebody. And since God makes you a somebody, you no longer have to compare yourself with others. You can put pride away. You can put autonomy away. You can delete that resume and say, no, my identity's in Jesus. And because he's loved me and he in all humility comes to me and he grants me new life and forgives my sins, then in turn, I can start living that way. As I've experienced the wholehearted love of Jesus towards me, then I can wholeheartedly return that love and I can also begin to wholeheartedly loving other people, other friends in lowly places, other lowly friends in all sorts of stuck places. I can go to them just as Jesus came to me with no condescension or condensation. <laughs> My friends, that's good news. That's another way, another angle of looking at the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he comes in all humility to us. And, 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 and what's our response? Well, I can be humble too, and I can admit all of my pride, even when I said I'm a staff member and that's too, too lowly for me. Friends, let's, let's go to Jesus. He's already there on bended knee, ready to receive us. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to kill our pride. And you died for our pride on Calvary. And you said, enough of this. And may we say, yes, enough of me. I do not like being this way. I don't like living this way. I don't like judging myself this way. I don't like judging and condemning others this way. I hate this constant trial, always seeking a verdict. And when I know that you look at me and say, you are my adopted and beloved son or daughter. That that's the verdict I really want. In the cacophony of crazy voices going on today, can we just shut that out and listen for the voice of Jesus? I don't hear a lot of gentle and lowly out in our culture right now. Can we buck that trend, friends? And be like Jesus. Can we come to others having nothing of self ambition or conceit? But can we, with the humility of Jesus, count others more significant than ourselves? Lord, help us. We can't do this alone. Folks, don't try this at home, it's going to blow up, burn the house down but burn our pride down and may we be filled with our compassionate shepherd. In his name we pray, amen. Amen, would you please stand and let's embrace by faith the one who humbled himself to redeem us and who is our Lord. Let's affirm our faith together uh, using these words uh, from Philippians 2. I believe that Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born of human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is Lord. And let's sing and worship him together. <laughs> 